and welcome back to the second half of this lecture where we learn about the land organisms that did survive in Antarctica past the opening of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the forming of the glaciers, and the, the drying and the uh, Antarctica becoming a cold, dry place, essentially. I lacked poetic inspiration there. But to give you some sense of what is still alive in Antarctica, this is the midge. And this is an insect that is the largest completely land-based organism in Antarctica today. That is a big contrast from the large mammals and dinosaurs that used to live in Antarctica. And one thing I'll mention is that for an animal to be considered terrestrial, its food source has to be land-based. This is why we don't consider seals, whales, and penguins to be terrestrial. Whales don't leave the ocean at all. Seals and penguins leave the ocean as little as possible and they require the ocean to feed. This is why the only seals we will find further inland are dead seals like the seal mummies I encountered. Since this part of the lecture is shorter, I put the announcements here. To give you a sense of what is coming up in the class, the lab based on plate tectonics is due this Friday, April 23rd. And aside from the presentation that the TAs have made, you will also want to review lecture five on geology and plate tectonics. There was also a review session um, the same day that I'm recording this lecture on April 19th, and that review session also covers a lot of material that may be useful for lab three. I also wanted to mention that reading assignment um, number one is due this Sunday, April 25th, and the midterm will um, open on Monday, April 26th, and be open until um, Sunday, May 2nd at 1159 PM. Now, a bit of a recap as to assignment number one. Um, it is it is about finding an article that's from a newspaper or another news source. Online is fine as long as it's reputable and as long as they have fact checked um, and as long as it's substantial enough that you can write about a page single space based on it. Um, you will want to pick something that is meaty enough that you could write 400 words about it and also that you find interesting because outside of a couple of points your response is pretty open-ended and again I'm not opposed to bizarre or gross topics because as I mentioned here somebody once submitted this article about penguin poop and they got full credit on it because they did everything I asked them to um, and honestly their response was pretty enjoyable to read. The points that you do need to address are, in your own words, what was the main point of the article? What is something you read about in the article that you had not previously known about Antarctica? And what was interesting about the article to you? And you also must include a link. You are otherwise free to, free to write about what you want. There are some points, uh, there are some bullet points in the description on the assignment itself in Gaucho space that show you some common ways to lose points that are, that are easy to avoid. And you submit this via the Gaucho space assignment. The TAs and I will grade it there. And please don't email it to me or link a Google document. It's fine to write it as a Google document or in Microsoft Word to look at the word count, but then just copy paste it into Gaucho space. Um, now, as for the midterm exam, I will be having a full review session on it on Monday, um, April 26th, a week from today. And I will actually be recording lecture nine on midterm exam review in office hours on Monday. And you will be very welcome to come and ask questions. And um, that will be lecture nine. I'll be recording it during office hours. Lecture 10, which will be recorded on um, Wednesday, April 28th, will not have any material that I will test you on. The midterm is going to be very much like the previous lecture quiz you took, but longer and with no short answer questions. All the questions this time will be multiple choice or true or false. And it will open on Monday, April 26th, but you may wish to wait until you've seen the exam review lecture that I will record during office hours. And the exam will be 50 questions and you will have 75 minutes to complete your attempt. It will be based primarily on lectures two through eight, as well as the supplementary readings and movies I've had you watch or read so far, like the short clip of March of the Penguins that I want you to watch around the same time as you complete lecture eight, as well as the clips of Walking with Dinosaurs and Frozen Planet, and then the climate and paleontology articles. I have already put up a study guide, and that study guide contains topics that you could potentially find on the lectures. And uh, 
excuse me, it, it contains topics that are from the lectures that could potentially show up on the exam. The terms on the study guide are the are the concepts that you could expect more detailed questions about. If you find yourself not knowing what one of the terms is, the first thing to do is to find that lecture and to look it up. I've listed them by topic and put what lectures they're from on there. So get ahead, um, go ahead and start studying now. Um, I am keeping the exam open all of next week again, just to give you a good window of time. But the study guide is up so you can start going through terms now if you want to get ahead on that. Now moving into the material for the second half of this lecture, Antarctica is largely covered in ice and snow now, leaving not much room for terrestrial, bi terrestrial wildlife. And in the areas that are free of ice, it is essentially a dry desert, windy, cold, and also dark for a good portion of the year. Very few plants grow in Antarctica and soil actually forms as a result of plants. So in places like the dry valleys, you have very little soil, mostly just a lot of bare rock. And this actually ends up being good as from a geologist standpoint because soil both covers up rocks and also it forms as a result of the breakdown of rocks. So places like the dry valleys have exceptional exposure as a result of this, relatively little chemical weathering and no plant growth covering them and no soil covering them. But it's very inhospitable for most life. We don't have any terrestrial mammals or reptiles or amphibians left in Antarctica, although all of those groups were present at least as late as the Eocene. All of them went extinct after the Antarctic circumpolar current formed. We do have some land birds in the subantarctic islands. South Georgia is home to several land birds, including the South Georgia pipit, which is the only songbird that's found near Antarctica. And it also is home to a distinct subspecies of the yellow-billed pintail, which is a duck who that is also known from South America. And most of the birds in South Georgia and the Subantarctic Islands are most closely related to South American birds that were able to colonize the islands. No land mammals ended up on South Georgia or any of the Subantarctic Islands um, because they are significantly far away from the mainland. If you consider the Falkland Islands to be the Subantarctic Islands, there was actually a species of fox there that was endemic to the islands, but that went extinct in the 19th century when humans um, eradicated it, unfortunately. The Falkland Islands are a bit closer to the South American mainland. But outside of that, no native land mammals in any of the subantarctic islands until, well, no mammals at all until rats show up. When humans, um, when humans start coming in ships, rats come along with them. And the birds of South Georgia were th very heavily threatened by these rats because they are endemic and found nowhere else on earth. And rats will eat their eggs and make it hard for them to reproduce. Rats have since been eradicated from many of the islands to restore the island's ecology to as close as they can get to before human contact. So some of these birds have seen their populations recover. None of these birds, um, none of these birds live on the Antarctic mainland or in Antarctica itself at all. The birds that do live in Antarctica itself, I will talk about more in the next lecture, um, lecture eight, when I talk about marine biodiversity. Going farther south onto the mainland, most of the land animals are arthropods, insects, spiders, the group um, arachnids, the group that includes spiders, mites, and their relatives. And um, arthropods also includes crustaceans, which is the group that includes crabs and lobsters, which are mostly marine animals, but you do have some land-based crustaceans like roly-polies. Those are actually very closely related to crabs. In Antarctica, you have ticks, which are arachnids, very closely related to spiders, and you have ticks that have adapted specifically to feed on penguin blood or on seal blood in some cases. So these researchers here are taking tick samples from an emperor penguin. You also have mites, which are another type of arachnid, and mites, um, we may know them as dust mites. One type of mite feeds on human skin, um, on dead human skin, and Mites often eat detritus or just stuff left around that nothing else would eat. And you, you get mites in Antarctica that live on moss, as well as those that live off of penguin poop in some cases. You have distinct species of mites at different penguin colonies. Now, the midge, which is the largest animal, land animal native to Antarctica, um, is 
an insect. It is a wingless insect and it is 1.3 centimeters long, which is a giant by Antarctic standards. It survives by keeping its eggs frozen all winter. And springtails do something similar. Springtails are these these creatures here, and they are not technically insects. They are um, they are a close relative of insects. They have six legs but no wings, and they're kind of a sister group to insects. They also live in Antarctica, grazing on moss, and they survive the winter by producing glycerols, which are compounds that are similar to antifreeze. So they basically use biological antifreeze to avoid avoid freezing through the winter. And that's something that we'll see also with ice fish and some other marine species that use that to stay warm in the Antarctic Ocean. Now, I've mentioned the term extremophile before to refer to organisms that can survive environments that would kill most other living things. Mostly those are microorganisms. Well, tardigrades are not technically an extremophile, they come close. They, they are one of the few multicellular organisms that really seem like they might be that they might be, that you could call them extremophiles. They're also known as water bears, and they have been documented surviving being frozen, being exposed to extremely high temperatures, being squished, um, going without food for long periods, and they have also survived trips into outer space. They are essentially indestructible, and that has let them continue to live in Antarctica. They will eat moss, and then when the winter comes around, they will freeze, and then they will just wake up again after being frozen, like, like nothing happened. They are not arthropods or mollusks or earthworms. They are their own phylum or group of animals. And you don't really think about them much because they're microscopic. They do have tiny eyes, fun fact. Um, but they are, it's not that surprising that they've held on in Antarctica. If they can survive in outer space, then it's not surprising that you'll have at least some tardigrades in Antarctica. Now, speaking of proper extremophiles of microorganisms, one extremely interesting example is blood falls, where you have microorganisms living in a lake that has little oxygen, and they perform oxidation reactions with inorganic, inorganic chemicals, including the iron in the rock underneath the lake in order to obtain food. And this lake, Bonnie Lake, receives very little sunlight because it's covered by a thick glacier and the water has very little oxygen, but the microorganisms nonetheless are able to survive by performing these inorganic chemical reactions. Sulfur and iron are converted to food, and in the process they produced oxidized iron. And at the one point of outflow, you get this stream of blood red water, which is colored by this oxidized iron, but it really seriously does look like blood. And this has been a big source of study. The scientists have been studying this heavily to see what, see, what sort of conditions life can survive under. I was close enough to blood falls to be able to spot it. Um, you can see, I, I was able to look with binoculars from a hill that's just a couple of miles away and I could see where the where the blood red water was coming out. So that, that was pretty cool and I'm glad I was able to see it if only from a distance. Now, another strange community that you get is the community of microorganisms that you get at the um, get at these seal mummies. And the interesting thing is that these seal mummies, it's not clear what they're doing there. You find them in the middle of the dry valleys and seals are marine mammals that don't, that are very ungainly and don't survive well on land. It's not clear why they decided to become land mammals and risk the trip out into the dry valleys where they have no food and where they are basically committing themselves to a death sentence. But they have never, even though they've never observed this with living seals, there's a hypothesis that this may occur during shifts in Earth's magnetic field. Seals use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate and to, and to, especially under the ice, to figure out where they are. And it's possible that during Earth's shifts in Earth's magnetic field, their compasses got confused and some of them just wandered up the valley, believing that this must be where they're going, even though, believing that this must be where they should go, even though all their other senses tell them, okay, this is land, don't go here. The seals appear to be juvenile seals in a lot of cases, and that also might be a factor that their nervous systems were still developing and they might have been more susceptible to shifts in the magnetic field. Um, also, they're just close enough to the South Pole that the magnetic field tends to shift around a lot because you have the magnetic pole moving and it's just 
it's just a bit weird. So I, I do think it has to do with past shifts in Earth's magnetic field, potentially. They can be dated using carbon dating, and they have been documented as being as old as, um, as old as 2,600 years. The reason that they've that they've stayed intact so long is because even though there are microorganisms feeding on them, because they're one of the few food sources up in the dry valleys, it's so cold that decomposition happens very slowly, and their skin will dry out before it can completely decompose. And so you end up with these mummies, just like how human mummies are preserved by drying the skin out before microorganisms can get to them. In Antarctica, these mummies just happen on their own because it's so cold. There is very little microbiotic activity. Now, as to the plants and other photosynthetic organisms that still live in Antarctica, there's only a few. I saw lichens a couple of times, and I saw moss just once. So you have, you have lichens and moss even in the dry valleys, but not very many of them. On the peninsula and the subantarctic islands, you have two species of flowering plants, the Antarctic hair grass down here and the Antarctic pearl wart up here tiny plants, like we'd see, we'd consider them weeds basically, but they are the only two flowering plants native to Antarctica. They are seeing their ranges expand in the peninsula because the peninsula is the fastest warming part of Antarctica. And it's possible that in addition to these two species spreading out, you may also start seeing more invasive species of plant. As Antarctica warms and becomes more hospitable to plant species, it's possible that it could see colonization by new plant species whose seeds or spores are borne by the wind. Now there's really not very much to terrestrial wildlife in Antarctica still. There is a lot more going on in the oceans though and that will be the subject of lecture eight which will be the final lecture of new material before the midterm exam. So stay tuned for that and I will see you all on Wednesday.